This episode of the Real Ag Radio podcast is brought to you by the BC Centre for Agritech Innovation at Simon Fraser University. Are you ready to grow your farm business with cutting-edge technologies and innovative solutions? Our centre will drive you towards an advanced future. Get the investment, expertise, and support you need to test and develop your products or ideas through our Agritech Development Program. Google SFU Agritech Innovation to learn more. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Monday edition of the show. It's Agronomic Monday today on the program. And thank you so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. Also, a big shout out to everybody listening to the show on the Real Ag Radio podcast. You can pick it up wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, let's dive in here. We're going to be joined today by Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson to be with us. We're going to talk about a number of different issues. I, I, we're going to really hammer on sulfur today at a part of our discussion. We're also going to be hearing uh, from some of our Agritechnica features. Of course, our Agritechnica coverage at realagriculture.com is brought to you by Optimum Gly, a new canola trait technology from Corteva AgriScience. We're going to be talking t- with Farm Droid and also Combine Settings. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And then we'll have some time at the back end for a little bit of a topic ag news stories of the day if you have any feedback on today's show or anything that's top of mind you can send me an email s haney at real or of course you can always call that real ag feedback line 855-776-6147 man i was excited on friday i was so excited it, well yeah the weekend was coming but it was really about were the blue jays gonna get shohi otani oh we were so close. At least it felt we were so close. I was. We had our staff Christmas party, and I was like locked in on this jet that then had Robert, whatever his name, from Shark Tank on there, Dragon's Den, blah, man alive. $700 million. $700 million over 10 years. Of course he goes to the Dodgers. Yeah, disappointing weekend. But, but you know what? Sometimes... The best business deal you can do are the ones that actually don't happen. To me, and like, I, I'm talking like beyond generational player, Otani is something on a, from a different planet. It's like he was a cyborg com, just manufactured in a lab. He's amazing. Okay. 700 million? That's like a, almost a billion Canadian for all of you currency experts out there. It, I don't know. It was way... I wonder why the Dodgers felt they had to go that high. And what I've heard a lot of people allude to is Messi's contract is about seven or sorry, $675 million. Otani wanted to be in that sort of stratosphere. And I listened to another station here on Sirius Satellite Radio on MLB Radio, on I think it's Channel 91, and they were talking on Sunday about how they sort of penciled it out in terms of how you would make this work, and they said that, you know, the Dodgers probably make money on this. So good for them. For the Blue Jays, maybe this is, maybe this is the best outcome. Maybe this is as good as it would have been, as great as it would have been. Maybe that's just too much to commit to one player. It's sort of like on the farm, right? You got that that piece of land, and it's like right there, and you're like, oh, it's it's like way above the market. And do we really need it? Do we really need it? Uh, and you kind of walk away, and it's like, okay, you know what? We'll survive. We'll be okay. We, you know, it's it's just dirt. It's eighty acres, or it's you know maybe it's a section. It's six hundred forty acres. There's other ones. We really wanted it. It was great. It would have fit into our plan. It would have been so great. We would have celebrated. We'd have been so excited. But sometimes the deals you don't get end up being the best deals for you, right? Maybe that's the way to be for the Blue Jays, or we're going to regret it for the next 10 years. We'll have to uh, wait and see. Okay, we're going to take a break. We've got more coming up here on Real Ag Radio. Peter Wee, Pete Johnson will be here right after this. 
it is time for a product spotlight. With me now, I've got Tyler Gullen. He's the technical services manager, Western Prairies for New Farm. You can't go far without having a discussion on resistant weeds, herbicide resistant weeds in Western Canada, specifically kochia. So how has New Farm been working on solutions to help farmers navigate the kochia and greater herbicide resistance challenge? So New Farm has been working really hard on combating herbicide resistance for a long time. And, and something we did recently was rediscover the, a lost herbicide in the process that we coined Duplosan. So Duplosan is a group four herbicide active, you know, a systemic good group four herbicide active. You know, the most exciting part for Western Canada is kochia is, is one of these eight herbicide resistant weeds that Duplosan is, is still controlling. If you want more information on Duplosan or Oxbow and how they can help manage resistant weeds in your field, you can always go to newfarm.ca slash Duplosan, that's D-U-P-L-O-S-A-N. At Vatterstad, we aim to be the world's leading partner for outstanding emergence. We're doing that through innovative tillage, planting, and seeding equipment that's optimized for your field conditions and soil types. We also offer industry-leading capacities to help you get the job done in shorter windows of time. It's all designed to give your crop the best start possible so you can maximize yields. Vatterstat, we look forward to growing together. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on Agronomic Monday. Co-ops grown with purpose recognizes how your farm brings sustainability, agronomics, and safety to our food, community, and environment. What you do matters. Make it count. Contact your local co-op grow team member to learn more. Sean Haney, your host here, now joined by our favorite guest on Mondays. It is Peter E. Pete Johnson. Hey, Pete, how's it going? How's your weekend? Weekend was awesome. Thanks, Sean. Uh, we could stand a little frost here. We still have some work to do, and it just it just seems like the temperatures are hanging around zero, just above zero most of the time. I get a little skip of snow if it does get cold, and and there's just some tillage that needs done. There's still some corn that needs to come out of the field. Uh, growers are running at corn, but uh, oh, the mess that it makes it just drives me crazy. We could. We could use a little frost to, to kind of tighten things up and get a few last things done out in the field. Yeah, kind of some co- cooler weather would firm up that ground a little bit, and we'd probably not make such a big mess when we're taking that corn out of the field. Exactly. Yep. No, absolutely. Now, mind you, I was pretty impressed when I was driving on, on the weekend on Friday. There were growers combining corn along a major highway, and they had loadouts to zones in the field, but they were still getting some, some mud on the road, and twice. I saw growers out on the road with the loader tractor scraping the mud off the road so that that it wasn't a problem for the uh, the other people using that road. So so kudos to them and keep doing it. Uh, we'd rather not have any mud on the road. I know all of us would rather have no mud on the road, but when you got to do it, at least make sure that you're making it safe for everyone else. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I remember one time. It, it wasn't it wasn't harvest. It was uh, fall time. A lot of times where I grew up uh, around you know Feedlot Alley in southern Alberta, a lot of people spreading manure in the fall, right? And uh, you know sometimes those trucks come out of the field, and all of a sudden there's this uh, paste, a nice you know nice even level layer of paste uh, we'll call it that is put on on the highway. And you got to think you know if you don't clean that up. Somebody's coming at about 120 kilometers an hour, and they're hitting that, right? And if, if they ever had to break, that's a extremely, extremely dangerous situation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, 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 there's many different different ways we can create hazards on the highway, and and we just have to do everything we can to avoid anybody getting hurt. And so, yeah, we we do the same thing with with manure here, Sean, and. And sometimes, you know, you pull out and uh, perish the thought that, that some slops out on the road as you make that, that turn. And then that can get to be incredibly slick. Like it's just you're coming down a dry road and it's, it's like hitting grease almost. And uh, that can be bad news, 100%. Yeah, for sure. Hey, this week... You're you're headed out my way. You're you're coming a little. You know, you're not getting all your way to Lethbridge, but you're south of us. You're you're going to be in northern Montana this week uh, doing some speaking. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm going to be in Fort Benton and in Joplin, 
uh, speaking for Shea Richter and Wilbur Ellis. Really looking forward to that. Uh, two different areas. And yeah, you're just going to be a whole lot of fun. Uh, I hope the growers that, that, that come to those meetings can, can buy into the, the typical Johnson philosophy where like fire questions at me. Don't just sit there and, and let me prattle on for, for the, the, you know, 90 minutes that, that I have on the agenda. It's, it's like, wow, fire questions and challenge me. And, and it's really hard, right? Coming from Ontario. It's really hard to always know 100% of what the problems are in diff- different areas. And my guess is that the problems are different in Joplin than they are in, in Port Benton just because the, the difference in rainfall and salinity or alkalinity. Like I think both of those problems can be big issues in that part of the world. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a ton of fun. Yeah, you've always said that, you know, you, obviously you're going there to speak and share some of your perspective and your knowledge and your experience. And, uh, but at the same time, you're learning too, right? Especially if you get that interactive crowd. There's nothing better th- as a speaker. I, I'm just like you. I, I love when there's lots of questions from the audience and you kind of get that bit of that forum kind of going. It's, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's okay to be up there and, you, you kind of got your keynote and you got it figured out, but it's, it's really, really great when you get that interaction from the audience and that two-way conversation. I, I love that, just like you do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I actually did one for Solio uh, this past Tuesday, and it was all question and answer. And so, like, well, we went over time, as usual. I often go over time, but there were just tons of great questions and uh, discussion and you know disagreement and that's even better because that's that's how i learn the most but it's it's a bad day when i don't learn a ton uh doing one of those those presentations sean that means nobody asked me any questions and that i don't know it's just way more fun when you when you can have that discussion rather than just blather on about whatever yeah 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 absolutely okay let's talk about sulfur uh, now, and, and some of the, I guess, residual or carryover considerations, this is very, very much a, a consideration for people in the West and the East. Uh, when we think about sulfur at this time of the year, what are some of the things we need to be thinking about? Yeah, so Dan Kaiser out of University of Minnesota uh, just released a really good study on on uh, sulfur that they looked at there. And, you know, we are getting different uh, sulfur sources all the time. And he used three different sources of sulfur. So here in Ontario, we always talk about sulfate sulfur in the spring. And that's because we get full moisture recharge. And if you have sulfate sulfur left in the fall, most of that is going to be gone over the winter. Maybe not all of it, but most of it. Whereas when you go west, well, you don't have that full moisture recharge. so, So things can be different. So he looked at three different sulfur sources. One is Tiger 90. So that's the typical sulf, sulf, um, elemental sulfur, the typical elemental sulfur that we, that we use, and it's, and it's pelletized. So the sulfur particles or the sulfur grind in Tiger 90 is not that fine. And they looked at potassium sulfate. So, you know, in Minnesota, potassium is generally not a big deal, so they can use potassium sulfate. And any response they get really should be to the sulfate sulfur. And then they looked at a new product. Uh, and I know there's, I know that, that there's some in Alberta, Sean. I know there's some in Western Canada. Uh, but it's a micronized elemental sulfur. So now you have elemental sulfur that is ground to the particle size of, I think it's 70 microns, if I recall correctly. Don't quote me on that, but it, like it's really ground finely. And oftentimes it comes and you have to spray it on the soil surface because it's, it's such a fine particle. But that fine particle, because elemental sulfur is converted to sulfate sulfur by thiobacillus and, and bacteria in the soil, when they have a big particle, they can't access all of the sulfur in that. It takes them a long time to get through Tiger 90. When they have that micronized particle then there's lots more surface area if you will for the the bacteria to work on and so they did that study for three years and the you know the annual uh, applications of 
of the three different products, just like you would expect that the sulfate was typically the best or, or, you know, spring applied sulfate would be as good as it got. But the micronized sulfate in the spring, the micronized sulfur, I should say, elemental sulfur was just as good. Whereas the Tiger 90, because the bugs couldn't provide enough sulfur to the crop, it wasn't as good. Then what's cool about that is they stopped putting it on to see the residual and the micronized sulfur the first year after at least, and they're going to run it for two more years, but the first year after there was enough elemental sulfur still in the soil in that fine particle size that the bacteria could work on that it was still equal to or the highest yield of anything. The sulfate, when they quit putting it on, it, it dropped right off because that sulfur had disappeared. And the Tiger 90 was kind of in the middle. There were, the bugs were still working on those granules or those pellets, but they still weren't able to access enough. And so this micronized technology, I think, is a really cool thought process. And, and Dan's work proving it, that it can work. Here in Ontario, by the way, uh, it was a sulfur year. We saw huge responses to sulfur in, in certain crops. Even some in soybeans, Horst Bonner saying that he saw more sulfur response this year than, than we would normally mm. expect in soybeans. Ken Nixon, one of the growers I think that you have on, on Farmer Rapid Fire sometimes, uh, never seen sulfur response before in his soybeans, saw seven bushels per acre. So sulfur is a big deal when you go deficient, but you know annual applications, finding cheaper sources, trying to find a way that you don't have to do it every year. This micronized sulfur really looks pretty cool. I'm looking at the Canola Council website. It says canola needs 0.5 to 0.7 pounds of sulfur per bushel of yield. So a 50 bushel per acre canola crop needs 25 to 35 pounds per acre of available sulfur. Um, So all crops are going to be different. In in wheat, some Googling tells me. That do you, I'm curious if you buy into this. Optimal nitrogen to sulfur ratio is 15 to 1. Does that sound about right to you? Yeah, so there's lots of different ratios. I'm not, a, I'm not really a ratio guy. Lots of people will say 10 to 1 sulfur to, to uh, pardon me, nitrogen to sulfur because that's most of the time the ratio that, that nitrogen to sulfur is in the protein in the plant. And that's where sulfur is really, you know, key is making sure that you can make that protein. So lots of people will say 10 to 1. I'm okay at 15 to 1 because there's always some in the soil. Mm-hmm. And and we it's really hard to, to kind of quantify that sometimes. And if you don't rely on some in the soil, you're going to spend more on sulfur, sulfur than you need. I know here in Ontario, lots of growers are kind of going even – even to maybe eight to one nitrogen to sulfur, just because as we've cleaned the, the environment up and, and most of our sulfur disappears over the winter, that, that they're seeing some response to that. But when we look at the, the nutrient removal, the nutrient removal really is more in that uh, 14 to one, 15 to one range. When I Because we just finished that study, right, Sean, uh, uh, in terms of nutrient uptake and removal in the wheat crop, we're, we're reporting on that data for the the Ontario Ag Conference, which is coming up in January. By the way, on the Ag Conference today, Monday, December the 11th, is the last final day to register for the in-person sessions at SWAC, where you can get to hear Sean Haney as one of our feature speakers. But anyway, that that uh, we're reporting that data at SWAC, and I'd have to do the actual math, but I think it's more in that 14 to 1 range, nitrogen mm-hmm. to sulfur. And, and my understanding is we're going... When we're soil testing for sulfur, we're, we need to go to two feet, like 24 inches. Is that correct? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, that's nitrogen soil sampling works. And in Western Canada, I think you generally try to go two feet deep. Here in Ontario, we go one foot deep. Sulfur is mobile, just like nitrogen. So you're 100% right. You know, Sean, the agronomist, comes through yet again. Uh, you need to go to the, the same depth as you would sample for nitrogen. And so with sulfur, it should be two feet in Western Canada. But boy, sulfur soil tests are just not nearly as reliable as nitrogen soil tests. And so you can, you can have an, a sulfur soil test that says for sure you've got enough. But when you get in the gray range, 
it's not as clear cut as it is with something like nitrogen and lots of like we're trying to get a sulfur soil test here in Ontario. John Lozon's been working on that, I think, for five or six years now, still hasn't been able to make it work. And uh, lots of, of Western Canadian soil scientists have tried as well. Sulfur soil tests are, are not quite as straightforward as nitrogen soil tests. Okay, before we take a break here, can I have too much sulfur? Like, is there a sulfur poisoning or something? Like, is, is that possible? So if you, if you add a, a whole bunch of sulfur, could, could it go toxic? Yeah. Sure, any nutrient can go toxic, but it would take an awful lot. Okay. And what it tends to do is lower pH. And so in Western Canada, in a dry climate, uh, we know that too much nitrogen lowers pH. And so if you also put on too much sulfur, you will exacerbate making that pH drop. And with lime as expensive as, as it is in parts of Western Canada that and, and the U.S. Midwest as well, uh, you, you don't want to overapply. You want to hit that target if you can at all. Yeah, well put. Okay, Pete, we got to take a break. We've got more coming up here on Agronomic Monday. Sean Haney, Peter Repeat Johnson. We'll be back right after this. Peter Johnson at WheatPeteRealAgriculture.com. I'm the host of The Word, and I love doing The Word. I love the questions. I love the challenges. I love having to apply agronomics to all over the globe and areas outside of my normal jurisdiction. Also, I love the feedback the most where growers challenge me, tell me about their plot results, help me to learn. The Word, absolutely the best part of my day. We are joined by the president of APAS. It is Ian Boxall. Okay, uh, I want to hit on the report APAS commissioned in regards to looking at what farmers are paid for commodities, but those prices in relation to the escalation of food prices. It's an education piece is how I see it, right? I see we can educate the, the public um, on what actually is the farmer's share of, of what they buy at the grocery store shelf on these A products. But then I think it also gives the consumer the ability now to ask the question is, like, where is the rest of my money going? Who gets the rest? Who in the supply chain gets the rest of my grocery dollar? Now let, let, let's let the other sectors do their share and lay it out there so everyone, so there's transparency in what the groceries are costing and where the money goes. You found that the, even with the increase in the price of commodities, food prices actually like jumped even higher. There was no direct correlation between the increased increase price of commodities and the increased price of groceries. Hey, really appreciate you joining us here, Ian. All the best to you, and thanks for having Real Ag Radio here at the APAS AGM. And welcome back to Agronomic Monday here on Real Ag Radio. Listen, join Western Canadian farmers, industry leaders, and experts at Crossroads Crop Conference happening January 29th through the 31st in Calgary, Alberta, as we examine big-picture innovation in agriculture for tickets and details Visit crossroadscropconference.ca. Okay, let's continue digging in here on All Things Agronomy with Peter Wee, Pete Johnson. Uh, Pete, up next. I, now, <laughs> I, I know that you, like, I have hay fevers. So I'm allergic to, like, barley dust is terrible. Uh, it, it's, it, wheat can be bad. Peas I'm okay on. Kosha, I am so allergic to. Uh, it's fresh cut alfalfa, awful. I know for you, you're allergic to tillage, but you wanted to talk about it here today. When does tillage make sense, Pete? So, Sean, you know, all things evolve. And it's kind of interesting because I got an email from a grower who said, I know that the moldboard plow is your least favorite tool. And he's right. But why then do we keep coming back to the moldboard plow? And he actually sent me a great set of data where he compared the plow to a a new chisel plow, and it was quite clear in the yield data and in the, the drone pictures, the drone video footage, footage from above, man, you're not going to chisel plow again if that's the outcome. But you really have to step back and say, how much tillage does it, it, does it take to get me to equal that moldboard plow? And I, even in Australia, there was a grower who was talking about mouse control in Australia, and he mentioned the moldboard plow, and the, and the feedback immediately was horrendous just because of the erosive concerns that we open ourselves up to in, in Australia, in Western Canada, 
tillage and it's all wind erosion, wind erosion, wind erosion. Here in Ontario, it's typically water erosion. But as you change tillage systems, man, oh man, you have to learn how to make that new tillage system work. And I have growers here in Ontario who, you know, we're wet here now. Uh, the last couple of weeks hasn't been a lot of moisture, but we're getting essentially zero evaporation. Like the, the temperatures are close to zero. It's high humidity most days. And so even though we don't have a lot of moisture falling, uh, brother, it just doesn't dry out. And I still see growers out there running disc rippers. And most farmers who've done those comparisons would say when you're in, when you're in crappy conditions, then the moldboard plow wins. And why does the moldboard plow win? It's because it takes that entire six inch or seven inch depth of soil, however deep you're plowing, and it inverts it so that now we have black dirt at the surface. It's all loosened up and it can freeze thaw. It can wet dry at the surface and we fix whatever damage we've done. The grower who sent me the chisel plow, they did it last summer super dry the moldboard plow it's maxed in clay man maxed in clay is, is just like marl clay it's really tough the moldboard plow was tripping the furrows without hitting rocks because it was that hard and dry and he went in there with a chisel plow and two-year-old alfalfa well the chisel plow is not going to do the same level of of lift if it can't hold its depth he said it wouldn't hold its depth and so we really needed sweeps there to get the lift and shatter. And it was simply too dry and hard to do that. And then I've had, I think, three or four growers tell me when they use the chisel plow, they get more weed pressure. And that was this, this grower's comment as well, more weed pressure. Well, okay, why are we getting more weed pressure? Is it annual weeds? Is it the alfalfa? Because more plow is going to give you better control of the alfalfa than any chisel plow ever can, uh, particularly if you don't put sweeps on and shake the dirt off those alfalfa tap roots. So I'm not a tillage guy, you're right, but even wheat peat has had to go back to a certain amount of tillage. So I now RTS my corn stalks because my corn yielded 230 bushels and it's such a matter of residue that trying to no-till into that next spring, especially because we combined in November and there's no residue breakdown this time of year. It's too cold. And if you get no residue breakdown, next spring you've got a blanket of residue and it just stays cold and wet. So a little bit of tillage, that we call that tickle tillage or, <laughs> or very light surface tillage just to start the breakdown, get a little black dirt there so it dries out a bit quicker. Uh, with big residual amounts, you got to do that, but you have to learn how to make these new tillage systems work. And you can't just, you know, start it one year and say, we're done. If you don't at least say, why was there more weed pressure there? What do I need to do? Because if you have weed pressure, you, you clearly are going to have less yield. In the aerial shots, you could see there was lower stand in the chisel pl plowed ground. There was more gaps and misses in the corn crop than there was in the mole board. So you like, you've got to fix those issues before you throw out that new tillage system. Isn't one of the challenges with tillage is that just relying on one type or one implement, that's where you kind of potentially go. Like, you need a lot of flexibility in your tillage system, but that just means more implements. I, and maybe this is happening, but I'm, I'm surprised to see, see we don't see more, like, sharing of, of tillage implements to have that added flexibility. To, is that at all true, Pete, or what's your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. So, you know, I, there are growers who have both a, a, a disc gripper and a moldboard plow because this time of year they're not going to use the disc gripper because they've done that before. And next spring, uh, if it's got, you know, any clay in it at all, it's liable to just be lumpy and hard to make a seed bed. And way we had that situation this year on some pretty nice dirt where the the grower went in and I mean, perfect situation, red clover, wheat stubble with a beautiful stand of red clover, the red clover caught and they went in late wet with a disc gripper. And this spring, you like they just had to fight to try to make that into a seed bed. So you have, you, you own both a disc gripper and a moldboard plow. How can you afford to do that? Or, or you make deals with your neighbor, uh, even with, with 
other til- tillage implements? Do you use a, a high speed disc or can you get away with an RTS, like just simple straight coulter blades? I think you're absolutely right, Sean, that every situation calls for something a little bit different and trying to own them all, all is hard. But the other problem is, you know, can you get access to them when you need them? Because the window of opportunity is often very small. Yeah, it, very much so. Hey, I, I know you wanted to also hit on um, when we're looking at data related to things like carbon emissions. And of course, this is a big topic right now. We're just, you know, COP28, it's, you turn on the news and it's just all about, you know, climate change and the environment and lowering emissions. And we saw the government roll out a methane reduction strategy for livestock over the weekend. Uh, like anything, data can be <laughs> very, very useful, but it can also be really, really dangerous if not used properly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you always have to keep it in perspective. And so I had a, a former farmer, he actually is retired now, but he sent me an email with a, a graphic that is going around on Facebook right now. Oh, that's dangerous right out. there. Well, oh yeah. <laughs> so as soon as you pull that graphic out of the document, now it's out of context, right? And so you say, okay, and then you put it on social media and how do people interpret? It? Now, I will give, give whoever pulled it out credit it's the graphic is from the group Our World in Data, and they do awesome work. I love their their charts. I use them in my presentation, but I put them up in my presentation, and I try to put a little bit of the the context around it. So this particular one was just about carbon dioxide equivalents from production of different uh, types of food, and and it it was on a per kilogram basis, and so. When you looked at that, it, as typical, livestock come out very poorly. So, so beef from a beef herd was 99 kilograms of CO2 emission equivalent per kilogram of beef, whereas tomatoes was 2.1 kilograms. And I'm not, I'm not picking on tomatoes. I'm not picking on beef. I, you just got to use an example of, of making sure you keep your perspective here because You'd say, well, gosh, then beef is 50 times worse. Tomatoes are two, beef's 100, 50 times worse. But if you think about that, you say, well, wait a minute. In a kilogram of beef, is there not more energy and more protein than in a kilogram of tomatoes? And the answer is absolutely. Plus, beef cattle eat hay and hay is really good in a cash crop rotation. And if you try to grow continuous tomatoes, you are going to wipe your soil out so that like, we already know that here, Chatham, Kent, the, the heart of tomato production in Ontario and, and tomatoes are moving out of that area into other areas because they've had tomatoes too close in the rotation. And so you need that, that alfalfa or you need that hay crop in there. And what do you do with the hay crop? You've got to feed it to a ruminant. But from a pure energy basis, when you, when you look at the pure energy basis, a kilogram of, uh, of beef is 2,500 kilograms, uh, uh, pardon me, 2,500 calories rather. A kilogram of tomatoes is 200 calories. So you have uh, about a 12-fold increase in the amount of energy and with protein, it's even a bigger increase. But when you apply that that 1,200 uh, factor to the kilogram of beef, it, it pulls it back so that now, instead of being 99 uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, if you do it on that, that kilogram of, or pardon me, on that, that caloric impact, it's a 7.9 carbon dioxide equivalent versus 2.1 at tomato. Still worse, livestock are not 100% efficient, so they're never going to be as good as, as growing crops, but at least it's a little bit different perspective in terms of, of how much impact versus how much benefit it has to the population as a food energy source. Pete, to wrap up here, I'm going to ask you really the question of the weekend. Should the Blue Jays have coughed up $700 million over 10 years for Otani? What, what are your thoughts? 
oh man, I would have loved to see him play it in Toronto. Uh, Toronto's a great team. They, you know, they're always trying hard to to put that team together. They've struggled the last little while, and and could Otani have come in there and been that spark plug that that drove them to do that? I, I who knows? We'll never know. But uh, should, seven hundred million is a lot of dollars. So do you pay that? Uh, uh, he's probably worth it. They probably should have done it, but uh, we'll never know. Seven. That's like it's almost a billion Canadian. It, it's just yeah, hard to get your head wrapped around. Uh, yeah, I, I I was really hopeful on Friday. I don't know. At six hundred, I felt really good. Seven hundred just seems like a lot. I we'll see. We'll see how it works out. But they got some uh, they got some bats to find for sure to uh, fill up that lineup. Find some more offense. Okay, Pete. Uh, hey, enjoy yourself in Montana. Say hi to everybody there on the High Line in Montana, all those listeners of Real Ag Radio. So uh, say hello for us, okay? Absolutely. Will do, Sean. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back with more of Real Ag Radio here on Agronomic Monday right after this. FP Genetics relentlessly brings innovative new seed genetics to Canadian farms, ensuring growers, breeders, and farmers are supported and viable. Being a valued partner on your farm for decades, you can expect the continuous pursuit of the best genetics. Visit fpgenetics.ca to discover FP's strong portfolio of wheat, durum, barley, oats, peas, and rye, or contact your local FP seed dealer or territory manager to discuss your certified seed strategy specific to your region. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on Agronomic Monday. Seeking professional advice for your farm and business? MMP's team of agriculture specialists cover it all, from business planning and tax guidance to financial projections, farm succession, and risk management. Visit mmp.ca to connect with the experts today. Okay, now we're going to dive into a couple different pieces from our Agritechnica coverage, which is brought to you by Optimum Gly, a new canola trade technology from Corteva AgriScience. Up first... Uh, a good friend of mine, Megan Madden, is a part of a group that has launched a new app, I, I, and we're going to hear about it right here. It, it's called Combine Settings, and it really allows for kind of peer-to-peer and crowdsourcing and sharing knowledge when it comes to setting your combine properly. She was at Agritechnica, and we had this chat. Right now, we're in the Agrifood Startup Building. This is all the companies that are really fresh, uh, new products, pitching to a, a lot of farmers and industry from around the world. And we're joined right now by Megan Madden. She is with Combine Settings. Megan, great to chat with you again. Thanks, Sean. We're, we're really excited to be here. It's our first uh, foray into Agritechnica as an exhibitor, and it's glad to see a, a friendly face. Okay, so yeah, it's great to see you again as well. So what is Combine Settings? In short, Combine Settings is a peer-to-peer platform for farmers to share Combine Settings globally. Okay, so basically peer-to-peer sharing here, like what what are they sharing? Here's how I set my machine in these conditions, or what does that look like? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You nailed it. So farmers log into the app platform, and then they load their, their, um, their manufacturer, their model. So say they've got an old John Deere 9600. Um, they go in there, they put in you know their fan speed, their concaves, the rotor, whatever, their, all the settings that are associated. And then they put in um, whether they're in tough wheat, dry wheat, whatever, all the parameters that we've got um, loaded up there as options. And then they push publish, and then they're able to search a bunch of other settings relevant to their own combine and model and they can see what everyone else around the world is using as well as like weather like what's the humidity are they also tracking what their some of their loss uh, percentages are things like that 
the losses are actually, we've got it measured in bushels right now. So we don't have it as a percentage, but we've got it in bushels per acre. Um, absolutely. So that's that's the whole basis is to reduce losses. That's why we created it. Yeah. And so that's what we're using as one of the metrics for sure. So is the idea for farmers, like say, let's just pick on Swift Current Saskatchewan for a second. I'm farming around Swift Current. I see how other farmers in the area are using it. Or are you even seeing some connectivity between, say, a farmer in Swift Current and a farmer in Australia? Yeah, once again, you totally nailed the concept. That's exactly what we've got. So we have the the global aspect where you can look up the same model crop conditions from Australia, from Germany, from South Africa, um, or we're in our next phase, we're launching a mapping function where you'll be able to search geographically by, you know, within five miles, I want to see my neighbors, or within 100 miles, and I can see what's happening around the province. Cool thing is you're, you're, you're manufacturer agnostic, right? It, it, be, be, it could be anything from a gleaner to a John Deere, and uh, farmers can share that info. Yeah, exactly. And that's the whole point of the app was agnostic's the perfect word, but that's what we want it to be. Um, you know, a lot of manufacturers have kind of their own system that's similar, but we really wanted to bring all the colors here together so that everyone could see, you know, not everyone just has one color or combine on the farm. So we wanted to bring all that data into one place. So give us an update on where you're at in terms of the, the it, it being live in the marketplace. I think you said it was in beta. Yeah, currently it's in beta testing. We've still got about four to 500 farmers uh, registered within the platform. So we're looking for feedback. We're giving it away for free for the next um, few weeks uh, for, the, for a year so that farmers can try it for a whole season in return for some feedback and some data uploading. And after that, we'll go to a subscription model. But yeah, so we, after our beta testing, we're actually in the background. We're still doing a bunch of updates and a bunch of heavy lifting. And so we're going to do a relaunch again in the next couple of weeks, hopefully for December 1. And and we'll, then we'll be in continuous improvement after that. I'm sure you're getting a lot of feedback from farmers, but also I know that a bunch of manufacturers have come through here as well, and the OEMs are quite excited about it as well. They really are, and that's what we're, we were really happy to hear. We don't want to be seen as competition. We're here for partnership, um, and so we did. We had a, quite a few, actually, manufacturers, dealers, retail level, um, everyone that's in the business of selling and, manu- and servicing combines come to us and say, great, how do we get on board? How do we partner? How do we get our, um, our customer base really left? leveraging this to share information because they can only be in one field at a time, essentially. Well, Megan, thanks a lot for joining us. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your Agritechnica. Thanks, I will, if I can find my way around for the rest of the time. Up next, we're going to feature FarmDroid. Now, this is a company that makes an autonomous robot that plants your crop and takes care of weed control later on. Very, very cool technology. They've also, they also told us, if I remember correctly, they have sold units into Eastern and Western Canada. Let's check out FarmDroid. A very cool robot behind us. I'm joined by Eddie from FarmDroid. Uh, Eddie, how's it going? Pretty good. I'd say we started here yesterday and it's been, uh, we were really overwhelmed yesterday about the uh, interest and so on. So that's been really good. Really good start. Awesome. Great stuff. Okay. So this is a product actually that has been sold into the Canadian market. You do have some customers in in Canada. What what is this droid doing? So basically it is, uh, the best way to describe it is that it's a seeding and weeding robot. So the uh, the whole concept with the robot is that it will do the seeding first or the planting, I think you would say in the US or in Canada and the US. Uh, So it will do the seeding and planting first. And then afterwards it remembers the position of each individual seed and can then go on to do the weeding both between the rows, so inter row, but also intra row between the plants. And then our latest addition, which we are presenting here at Agri Technica this year, is our spot spraying system, mm. uh, where we, so the robot can now do both uh, seeding and planting, and it could do, uh, when, I say, when I say planting, then I mean seeding, right? So yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. to be 100% clear, we can't do transplanting. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, it's doing seeding, weeding, spot spraying, um, and then also we have a camera system on the robot now for transplants as well. Wow. Okay. So and when it's doing the when it's doing the seeding, is it where where is the seed being stored? It, yeah. So it has uh, you, the unit here behind us now is a six six row configuration. So it could be configured in different uh, uh, with different row spacings and so on. But then we just have the hoppers on. Um, it was designed for sugar beets back in the day. Yeah. Uh, so each unit uh, can contain around one hectare, two and a half acres of uh, of sugar beet seeds. Okay. So one robot like this in this configuration could do six to uh, six hectares of fifteen acres of uh, of sugar beet in a day and then you have to go refill it. Solar powered? Solar powered, all solar powered. Um, we're from Denmark ourselves where the sun doesn't always shine as much. That's the same in Canada I would uh, I presume. Uh, but even though uh, the solar energy is enough to keep the robot running uh, at daytime even if it's, a, if it's a cloudy day like we have today outside here. Yeah. 
Um, it's a sunny day. The robot will run 24 hours a day, only on solar. So when the sun goes down, it will just start running off the batteries. Okay, so we let, let's say we're in weed removal. We're doing the mechanical weed removal, or we're doing some spot spraying. What, what kind of acreage, or hec, you know, how many hectares can we do in a day? Um, so in a day, the robot can do up to six and a half hectares per day, which would equivalent to uh, what 15, 17 acres, I think, something like that yeah. a day. Um, it depends a little bit on different configurations, the seed configurations, um, the spacing between the seeds. The smaller the spacing is, the, the slower we have to go for the position. Um, but uh, other than that, around these six, six hectares uh, or 15 acres a day. Okay, so you mentioned that if we're using it as a seeder, it remembers where it put each seed, so it knows where the plants are. That's very helpful at weed removal time. Yeah, yeah. What if we used a more uh, conventional unit to, to seed our crop and then wanted to use this for weed removal? Can it detect where those plants are and, and do the mechanical weed removal? Yeah, so we have, as I said, we just had our latest addition is the uh, the camera system on the robot. Okay. The problem with, uh, the reason why Farmer has been quite ex- successful with selling our machines and why we have the concept of us remembering the position of the seeds is that if you do transplant of vegetables, let's say, yeah. then a camera works quite well because they recognize the pattern and then they know where to weed and where not to. Yeah. If you direct seed something like we would do with, uh, it could be sugar beets or onions or something like that, uh, it's very difficult because the weeds will grow at the same time, so there's no pattern for the camera to, um, to, to recognize. So that's where the remembering of the plant oh, sorry, comes in handy. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay, cool. So w- where do you see this product going in the future? What are some of the next innovations that you're excited about or thinking about? So uh, right now, we've, we started selling in Canada since last year. Uh, but in, in Europe in general, I'd say our main focus has been on organic sugar beet, which has not a lot of in Canada, uh, but also organic onions, uh, beetroot, and so on, vegetables. Uh, so that, that is still our main market as now. Uh, but with the spot spraying it, uh, as an addition now, then uh, we are looking more and more into the conventional side of business. It will be conventional, still be some high-value crops like sugar beets or vegetables or something like that. Uh, but, but definitely moving more into, it could also be corn, uh, soy or something like that. Do you, I know you're working through dealers, but w- what would a robot like this uh, cost the farmer? I think in Canadian, I think it would be something, it depends a lot on the yeah. configuration, right, and the no, add-ons, but I think it's something, a rough estimate would be around 100,000 Canadian or something like that. Okay. And, and in Europe, are, are farmers buying one of them, or do they have multiple of them? Yeah, it depends a lot. Actually, we have our customer stories rolling here behind us on the TV, um, and we have, we, have a, we have several farmers who have four or five machines. Uh, especially in eastern Germany where they have bigger fields, not compared to Canada, they have even bigger fields. Um, but um, it depends a lot on uh, some farmers, they will use one robot for multiple different crops. So they would use one machine for maybe five different crops of vegetables, whereas others, they would have five robots running in uh, uh, 250 acres of sugar beet or something like that. And, and if you did have, if you had four of these, do they work in a, can they work in a swarm concept? Yeah, so... Um, it's, uh, it's something we're looking more into, but it's, it's just a simple software thing, so it's something that could easily be updated. But it's, uh, yeah, it could, uh, you could easily put multiple robots into the same field and then uh, sort of swap the data between them. As I mentioned, all of our coverage of Agritechnica is brought to you by Optimum Gly, a new canola trait technology from Corteva AgriScience. Some, we just had two examples of some of the great features that we did at Agritechnica, and you can go to realagriculture.com and find all of that great coverage. About four to five new videos coming up every single week to probably, <laughs> probably about March. We've got lots of stuff that we're bringing home from that big trip to Germany just a couple weeks ago. Secure your farm's longevity with Farmer's Edge. Elevate soil health, optimize costs while maximizing yields, and embrace the future of agriculture with Farmer's Edge Fertility Services. Visit farmersedge.ca slash farmers to learn more. Okay, we'll be right back on Real Ag Radio with the top ag news stories of the day right after this. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. I get to spend every day talking to farmers in the ag industry through realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. 
but nothing is more fun than speaking to an audience live and in person. If you're planning an ag event, book a real agriculture speaker to make it a successful and memorable experience. Email shaney at realagriculture.com and you can book myself or any other real ag personality to speak at your event. Bring your audience all the fun, insight, and energy of real agriculture. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio. It's now time for the top ag news stories of the day here on the show. First, I want to tell you about Invita. Invita bridges the nitrogen gap all season long, enabling your corn crop to fix the nitrogen it needs from the atmosphere when and where it needs it most. Let Invita set your crop up for success by requesting it from your local retailer. Okay, I want to make sure we get, we don't have a lot of time here, but let's dig in on uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada has published its draft protocol for reducing enteric methane emissions from beef cattle. It's the REME protocol. This is the fourth draft protocol under Canada's greenhouse gas emission offset credit system. The REME, the REME, we'll call it. The REME protocol is <laughs> intended to incentivize farmers to implement changes that would reduce uh, eccentric, I'm, I think I'm, I know what I'm saying that right, methane emissions from their beef cattle operations with an opportunity to generate offset credits that they can sell. This latest protocol protocol for a regulated carbon offset market is in draft form and open for input until February 6th of 2024. The government of Canada is seeking input from stakeholders on the draft Remy protocol. Interested parties are invited to submit comments via email by February 6th uh, to, um, there's an email address that we have in our story at realagriculture.com. Um, so yeah, we'll be getting reaction from farm groups and others as the week progresses here on the show. It's uh, what well, we'll see. I, I, I want to get the expert opinion on if, if the draft is fair, reasonable, an opportunity for the industry, or is this something that's going to be rather burdensome, not really take into account some of the efforts that real that agriculture has made and things like that. So we're, we're going to be following this one very, very closely for for sure. In in other news here that we want to make sure that we, we get to now, here's interesting. So we're going to see the. Uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine, he's going to be visiting Washington, I believe, this week to lobby for more funding. New research out or a survey out saying nearly half of American voters think the U.S. is spending too much money on aid for Ukraine. Now, opposition was particularly pronounced among Republicans, with 65% saying the U.S. was spending too much in Ukraine, compared with roughly half, 52% of independents, and a third, 32% of Democrats. So the Democrat number is, it's it's a third, right? So this is not just a, a right-wing thing. This is something that's building. I, I heard an interview this morning that there's some concern on the Democrat side that for that third that believe uh, a third of Democrats that believe the U.S. is spending too much in Ukraine, it's hurting Biden's popularity even more, even within within his own party. There's an opinion column in the Globe and Mail saying uh, profits in the Canadian grocery sector will likely exceed $6 billion in 2023, setting a new record as they rise 8% from last year, according to the Center for Future Work. New research by the Progressive Research Institute, Institute found that food retailers are now earning more than twice as much profit as they did pre-pandemic. Jim Stanford, economist and director of the Center for Food, food Work, Future Work, boy, I'll tell you is set to present the report's finding on Monday to House of Commons Agriculture Committee meeting on stabilizing food prices. And for some reason, the grocer continues to be the focus in, in some of the circles around Ottawa. And be careful what you wish for, everybody. If, if we're going to say, hey, um, yeah, like that industry has made too much money. We need to fix that. We need some sort of windfall tax, as an example. Careful farmers, because what if that what if that cannon was pointed towards you saying, hey, agriculture making too much money. Let's put a windfall tax on you. You know, hey, you, you know, maybe all Canadians should benefit from corn going to record highs. Think about how we would be out. We would go crazy and rightly so. So I, I'm I'm kind of skeptical of of some of this some of this attention that is uh, we're getting in the grocery system. If you have any feedback on today's show, send us an email s haney at realagriculture.com, or of course you can always uh, call the real Ag feedback line eight five five seven seven six six one four seven. Thanks everybody for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. 
thank you for downloading this episode of the Real Ag Radio podcast, brought to you by the BC Centre for Agritech Innovation at Simon Fraser University, your go-to for advancing agritech. Ready to elevate your farm business? Achieve the productivity and profitability you're looking for with Agritech Development Program. Google SFU Agritech Innovation to learn more.